one day flows into the next. Ah, nice to see you. It's perfect timing. Oh, right here for too. the in introduction of the executive cool. director of the Sag Harbor Whaling and Historical Museum is joining us today. So My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. Well, can we so, go inside and take please? a look and yeah. tell us all about the Absolutely. Museum? Happy to bring you inside. Uh -huh. So, okay. so what are we doing? We're just going to come into the museum and take a look around. This is really a perfect place to just mention that the house itself, uh, somewhat coincidentally, was built in the 1840s by the owner of whale ships. Okay. So that isn't why we were founded to be here. It so happened that the museum was invited to come in and set up exhibits in the 1930s by the Masonic Lodge, which then owned the property. Okay. And it just happened to have been a whaling owner, you know, ship owner's house. Um, so it's a fabulous house, Greek revival in style, dating 1845. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's now, one of the Masons our, still own the building? They do not. They actually okay. sold the property to the museum in the 1940s. Okay. But with that sale, they reserved the future use of the property. Mm -hmm. So they continue to meet here. They meet upstairs. Okay. Uh, museums these days really have to be very um, uh, accessible to all, you know, so the, the, we can't really even think of expanding to an upper story. You know, we don't have elevators. You know. right. So we're quite you know, self-sufficient on the main floor. Mm -hmm. And then they come in and meet upstairs. What so, a magnificent stairway. Well, you should come in and see it. OK. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, the staircase is really one of the kind of architectural uh, gems of the house. And if you come all the way in, you can look up. It's a spiral staircase that rises oh. up. Uh, Try to get it three up. stories up to the up to the attic level, and there's actually a dome that projects up above the roof, uh, so it becomes a skylight and uh, sheds natural light down through here. If you imagine this house in the 19th century, it didn't have any electric light, of course, mm -hmm. and so lighting the interior was was uh, probably a great effort, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly having a skylight, which most houses of the period wouldn't. Right. You know, was, was an additional source of natural light. Any sort so. of trouble with leaking? Mm, I should knock wood. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. <laughs> no, good. no. But it's a wonderful stair rail that rises. It's a uh, tiger maple, which was a very popular and decorative wood of the period. You see it used in a lot of furniture, mm -hmm. uh, but utilized here. So the architect was Menard Lefebvre. He was a pretty prominent New York architect. Actually came out to design the Whalers Church, the Presbyterian Church here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Huntings were prominent members of the local con congregation of the church. So they then hired the architect to design this. So, so we're very happy here because these are, it was designed as a private home, but the scale of these rooms, the height of the ceiling is about 12 feet or so. The rooms are large and so they're very well, you know, well uh, uh, suited for large exhibitions that we do. So perhaps we should go in the front. Absolutely. Parlor. Okay. We came. This is this one of our. Uh, one of our larger rooms, and uh, we believe it was probably intended to be a music room or a place of entertainment. And so, hosting these these uh, concerts, these music performances. Uh, now, I doubt that the Huntings would have had 50 guests, you know, crowded in around cafe tables. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's very beautifully lit because there are three uh, floor-length windows leading out to. The Veranda out there, and um, it's a tough room. I'll tell you, when you design an exhibit, it's it, there's very little wall. Mm -hmm. you know, there's oh. so much architecture in there. Yes. The windows are large. The casings are sort of over overscaled. Mm -hmm. uh, columns that are there. Mm -hmm. So when you begin to try to plan out where to hang things, typically we'll introduce new walls that are just brought in, you know, to the middle here, mm -hmm. uh, to you know, and give us more right, more exhibition space. But because we're doing double duty this summer with music events, uh, we had to design it so that we could, we could take advantage of the board. Now, this exhibit is about Cappy. He was one of our citizens here yes. at St. Father. Cappy was a, quite a character. There's still, uh, this of course is the 100th anniversary of his birth in 1911. There are still some of the older residents here in St. Father who remember him. Mm -hmm. uh, while perhaps not his contemporary, certainly knew him. He was a very public figure. He came here uh, in the 1940s 
and became very involved in civic affairs with uh, teaching young people to, to sail. He was quite a, a mariner himself, a sailor, and uh, his interest in sea scenes, the whaling pictures, kind of grew out of that aspect of his life. So he studied whaling, the history of whaling, and uh, this was not his only subject material. This is what we're focusing on because that's of particular interest to us. But we're, we're looking to kind of better establish his reputation as an artist and an illustrator because he was a very talented artist and um, he's locally well known, but perhaps not as well known outside of the sphere of Sag Harbor as, as he might be. Now part of that may be of his own doing because he painted under numerous aliases. So some of his pictures are, are labeled as mm -hmm. such, you know, Amundsen, mm -hmm. but he painted under a dozen or more aliases. wonder why he did that. We don't know. <laughs> uh, you know there, I'm sure there was a good reason. Mm -hmm. I think it may have amused him. You know, I think he, he thought that that was funny. Mm -hmm. um, and um, some of the pictures are uh, Gloucester School, so they're, they're you know, fishing boats, but you can always tell it's a very characteristic style. So the other exhibit that's up this summer that Terry Wallace, who is our guest curator, helped actually create for the Historical Society is specifically a show about the paintings signed under these aliases. Oh my. So that's quite interesting. Uh -huh. Uh, and then we actually we have some works hanging down at the American Hotel, and we'll have a benefit fundraiser down there later in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are works that are for sale. Whereas, of course, the ones so, the museum are not. <laughs> so. But so, in other words, if you buy the Academy's paintings, mm -hmm. then you, it will get the proceeds, all of them, or a portion not of the all, proceeds? A portion of the proceeds will come to the benefit of the museum. Okay, and is, this is yes. done by Wallace Gallery? Uh, Wallace Galleries in East Hampton. Terry Wallace is the owner gallery and has long studied this painter, has been researching his life and works, and has actually written a book uh, which will accompany this exhibit. Kind of a catalog raisonne of his, his artwork. So yeah, this is really sort of the Cappy's year. Right. Yeah, so we're really thrilled about it. He came to a sad end though at the end. Well he uh, grew old, mm -hmm. you know, as uh -huh. hopefully all of us were well, lucky enough to do. Um, but he was homeless for a time, wasn't he? I, I wouldn't say he was actually homeless, but he got to the point where he probably needed a lot of care. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I never met the man, so uh -huh. I don't know. But there are a lot of people in town who remember him very fondly. And um, so he lived a good long life, mm -hmm. and a very prolific one as an artist. So, so we're very lucky to have this much of his art. At one yeah. place. I yeah. noticed that a lot of the yeah. collectors have shared yes. their beautiful works with yes. you. Well, two of them hanging in this exhibit are owned by the library across the street. They've been very generous to, to lend them to us. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them are in the collection here, and then others are local collectors. There are many local residents have a cat, mm -hmm. or had one, or their mother does, or something, because he uh, he was that prolific, and he would show at, at outdoor shows and people would buy them. What if he did any actual whaling himself? I don't think so. Uh -huh. No. But you can tell and look at them that he was he was comfortable you know, out, out of the water. I mean he sailed and he you know, so he's uh, he was certainly familiar with the uh, now the one thing that I learned about him is that he uh, many years ago in the thirties, I think, when he still lived in New York, he began the, the, these outdoor jury art shows. Mm -hmm. I think this was his idea. Mm -hmm. uh, he brought that out here uh, for a while and we are restarting that. So our first annual uh, outdoor jury art show will be the weekend of Harbor Fest, which is September 10th, I believe, Saturday. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a jury art show outside here on the lawn, kind of in the spirit of, of this event that he either invented or, or expanded upon Foster. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that that will be successful. We'll be inviting artists from all over the lawn. And uh, yeah, that'll be another, another kind of event to honor his, his legacy. And, uh, and if that's popular, we'll, we'll do that every year. Wonderful. Oh, awesome. that looks like. Yeah. Tell us, explain to us what this was used for. That's one of my tripods. <laughs> and without digressing into uh, too much about tripods, mm -hmm. first, when you're in a whaling museum, there's no such thing as too much about a tripod. Mm -hmm. Trying the blubber is simply boiling it down into the oil. And the oil 
was the major product that was rendered from, from the whale. This fully round uh, cast iron pot is the type that would have been situated down on the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, these date from the uh, into late 18th century. Uh, that was a period when whaling was much more local and whales would be captured, uh, killed, and brought back onto shore to be cut and boiled out. And then you would use a, a kind of a skimmer like this, kind of an overscale kitchen utensil, right. and you would run this through the oil as it's, as it's uh, boiling to skim out the skin and other uh, matter like that, which would then be fed into the fire underneath it. Now outside, we actually have, there's another kind of pot which when whaling went to sea mm -hmm. out of long voyages, mm -hmm. which started in the late 18th century and can, continued right up until about 1850. These were voyages that could take two or three years at a time. Wow. And so, in fact, at that point, the whale ships become factory ships, and these pots are taken off the beach and they're put onto the deck of the ship. And off they go. So in other words, here's a ship traveling throughout the South Pacific, up into the Arctic perhaps, um, capturing the whales, rendering them on board, filling the casks of oil, and they would only come home when, they're, when the hold was, was full. Those are the pots, are, so it's all whaling pot aficionados. They're the ones that have slightly flattened sides. Okay. Because they were meant to sit next to each other so they would roll around on the top. Got you. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you see, Occasionally driving around out here, you'll see a very big pot on somebody's lawn. Mm -hmm. uh, people do have them, but of course, if you have one, it's very hard to take it anywhere. Mm -hmm. I was just saying, that's not something you can do. Tremendous weight, yeah, this does not move very easily. So you either have a fully round one, those tend to be the earlier ones, mm -hmm. and the flattened ones date from the later era of the world. So now you, you have the whole story of well, What percentage of the economy for Sag Harbor was based around whaling at that time? Well, there were other maritime, uh, there was other trade, mm -hmm. there was international shipping coming in of Sag Harbor throughout the entire 18th century, mm -hmm. and that's why after the revolution, uh, Sag Harbor was uh, named and authorized as one of New York State's two ports of entry, official ports of entry. That's why we have a customs official whose job it was to keep track of the imports and exports to the port. So whaling was one of the major shipping you know, maritime interests, but it certainly wasn't the only one. Uh, a man like Benjamin Hunting, who built this house in the 1840s, had anywhere from eight to 10 whale ships out at any one time, and became wealthy uh, in that trade. Because a, a, a ship full of oil could generate um, a profit of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in fact, so, which, which was a, which was a tremendous fortune. Yeah. Right? So, uh, but of and course, the house is glorious is this one. Yes, and over time, it's interesting to me uh, that the house was actually built about 1845, and that was the absolute uh, apex of the industry mm -hmm. because things dropped off very quickly after that uh, with the discovery of petroleum in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It was dug successfully, the petroleum could be brought to the surface and, and uh, processed into kerosene as a lighting fluid. Mm -hmm. And the minute that became possible, whaling basically went out of business very quickly because that was the major product, right. the whale oil for lighting the lamps. Uh, and so the fortunes went away. Uh -huh. But Sag Harbor went on. There had been a tremendous amount of money had been made here, and um, things kind of drifted along for another 20 or 30 years before other manufacturing interests came to town and rescued rescue the, the local the locals, the local economy. Uh, in the 18th century and early 19th, I would say, not just whaling, but all things related to rigging ships and, and uh, provisioning them, building 